I am really happy to be able to be here today because to come to Medicine Grand Rounds and be able to talk about the clinical impl implementation of pharmacogenomics, which is really what our three speakers today will be talking about, is something that I was not sure I would be around to ever see. So it's come much faster than we could have ever hoped for, and it's because of a team effort, and you're going to see members of the team standing up here making the presentation in just a few moments. Mayo has had a reputation as a leader in the discovery aspects of pharmacogenomics for a long time, but what we're here today to talk about is that this is now coming right to the bedside. You need to be asking, what does this mean for the patients I see and for my practice? And the three people whom we have who will be making this presentation couldn't be better selected. The first is Nick Nicholson, who both has an MD degree and a PharmD degree, and has, I think, the main reason that we have Nick here is to thank him for his leadership of the Pharmacogenomics Task Force, which was implemented originally by the Center for Individualized Medicine as part of their charge to try and bring genomic medicine to the bedside in every possible way that they can. And Nick will be telling you about that aspect of what makes today's uh, presentation possible. Eric Matei, who has been a pharmacist and is a PharmD here at Mayo for some time, and we were uh, terribly fortunate to recruit him here from, from Howard, has made it a special part of his expertise to develop expertise in pharmacogenomics. And one of the lessons that we have learned as the Center for Individualized Medicine has moved forward with this effort is the absolutely critical role of the pharmacist as members of the team to help make it possible to bring this aspect of medical science to the bedside. And finally, Costas Lazaridis, as you all know, is professor of medicine and a consultant in gastroenterology. What you may not know is that he also is an expert in genomics, having trained with Francis Collins. So, so I think that probably counts as a reasonable uh, uh, kind of mentorship to, uh, uh, to be able to contribute to genomics. But what they're all going to tell you is part of a really concerted effort to bring this aspect of clinical genomics right to the bedside. And it's an aspect of clinical genomics, which I just explained to another group a few moments ago, is going to eventually be for every patient everywhere. And with that said, I went 15 years taking wrong medications or medications that weren't effective. And there are drugs I can't take because I can't assimilate it. And I can take them and take them and take them and take them. And when I've got the list of drugs that I did not metabolize, like a light went off my head said, that explains a lot of things. I can't ever go to a clinic without them asking if I have an allergy, uh, but nobody asks me if I have a deficiency. He called me back and said, well, sure enough, um, Celexa doesn't work for you. And I said, you're kidding. I've only been on it for like 12 years. She explained it like the medications go through pathways in the liver, and that was one of the pathways that I did not have genetically. I am missing that 2D6 pathway. Good afternoon, I'm Nick Nicholson. I'm a clinical pharmacologist and have been working along with the pharmacogenomics pro uh, project for a little bit of a while. And basically the reason I do this uh, I work in many areas within the institution on drug safety. This is what drives me. This is what gets me up every day. Over 100,000 people get killed by drugs every year. This is back in 1994. I would suggest the number is higher. I would also suggest that even though we pay attention to this, we don't give it enough attention that it often deserves. Let's put it in a little perspective with something you know. Here's a CDC list of things that you probably work with all of the time. Heart disease, cancer. If we were to put drug, adverse drug reactions in there, they don't put that in the CDC list. I wonder why. Um, even more interestingly, if we put adverse drug reactions are when we use the drugs correctly. If we were to put adverse drug reactions and medical errors in there, things that we know cause drug problems, that would move that up to number three. So 
what, what causes our drug problems? We know inherently a lot of these things. We know that we have differences in age. We have differences in physiology, different things our patients can do to change the effect of drugs, having concomitant drugs, having concomitant pathology. Well, one of the things that we're learning more and more about is some of the genetic causes for some of the problems that we're having and some of the genetic problems we have with our drugs. Pharmacogenomics, what is it? Simply, it is the mix of pharmacology and genetics. We know that there's genetic considerations with drug problems, and what we've been trying to do is figure those out. One of the easiest ways to look at some of these problems, I'm going to start small and work my way up, is to look at um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And here's a little example right here. We got a little DNA strand, and you know, subject one, we code for our protein one way with an AT. We get a point variation where now we have a CG, and now we get a different protein. These proteins go to code for tra uh, receptors, transporters, and metabolic enzymes. And these variations can ch obviously change the function of these things. These polymorphisms can result in drug toxicity, adverse drug reactions. We might not go on to activate drugs that are prodrugs. We might have lack of efficacy for mul multiple reasons. So these are the things that we want to fo uh, focus in on as we look at some of these things. Now, if we look at how did we get to the point we are, we're actually doing this today. This is not futuristic stuff anymore. I know for years and years and years there's been articles around saying, genetics is coming your way. And you're probably are saying, well, where is it? Well, guess what? Here is now. So we've got actually a pharmacogenomics task force within the institution. This is, works very closely with the Center of Individualized Medicine um, and with the uh, PNT committee. What we do is if there's a laboratory test that we could use that will help protect our patients, we work with practice to see how we could implement a rule to um, pop up alerts or give information or provide information to our practitioners so we can make things a little more safer. Now, once we've actually decided we're actually going to go ahead with a rule, and I'll show you how some of those things work, you can now see that there's a whole other gang of committees we could all be part of where basically they're uh, working along with IT, education, Ask Mayo Expert. You'll find most of this information that we're talking about today in Ask Mayo Expert, and we like to do research on it. As a pharmacologist, I often find there's two problems when we often work in medicine, the two simplistic problems. They're either pharmacokinetic problems or the pharmacodynamic problems. We look at pharmacokinetics, absorption, uh, metabolism distribution, excretion of drugs. We often look at the way we get these drugs out. And we'll look at one example with codeine. You guys are all familiar with codeine and a metabolic enzyme. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this one. That's why I chose it. The other one would be more pharmacodynamic, and the example I'll use is allopurinol. Now, to get lipophilic drugs out, especially drugs that cross into the CNS, we have to metabolize them. Otherwise, we'll just continue to reabsorb them. Um, often, I'm the course director for clinical pharmacology in the Mayo Medical School. So for some of you guys who've taken, been at Mayo Medical School for the last few years, maybe you uh, remember our class. This is one of the things I like to talk about. This is usually when my students head for the exits, because whenever they see this stuff, they just gloss over. There's a pretty easy way to look at some of this stuff. What we can do is just kind of take a couple enzymes at a time. 3A4 is probably responsible for, give or take, probably 50% of the drugs that get metabolized by P450. Um, 2D6, about 25%. 2C9, a substantial amount, a smaller amount by 2C19. The ones I often tell my students to focus in on is 3A4 and 2D6 when it comes to the overall metabolism. But for pharmacogenomic problems, probably 2D6 is probably the bigger culprit. We also have variation in 3A4, 2C19. We also have a little bit, uh, there's a couple things we can do with 3A4, but not as big. When we look at some of these things, how do we get the results and how do we process some of this stuff? Well, most of the time we look at how this is all put together, but primarily what we're most concerned about is these alleles. You get one from mom, one from dad. These are star alleles, so you get star one, star four. You know what I mean? So you get star three, star four. You know, these kind of things will put together a function of an enzyme. So star one, star one would be normal, as you can clearly see here. Uh, the problem with this is there's hundreds of these variants. 
And if I had this chart probably all the way full, it'd probably go down into the second row there. So we don't really want to work with those clinically as much if, unless you're maybe doing research. This is good for the lab, and they can usually tell us what we're doing, but primarily when we're trying to work with it, we usually get more of a report that looks like this. So how do we navigate this report? Rather than trying to figure out star 3, star 4, star 1, or whatever it is, what I suggest people do is go to the phenotype. The phenotype will probably give you the enz enzymatic function. For a more detailed report, you could go to the 2D6 interpretation. But in the case of codeine, what it needs to do, it needs to be activated. So if we look from codeine to morphine, codeine itself just simply does not work. I work for the Department of Anesthesiology. Codeine is not that great. But you can see as it gets metabolized by 2D6, it increases its receptor binding by thousands of times once it's uh, metabolized to mor morphine. So basically, when you give them codeine, you give them morphine. That's what works. Um, oxycodone and hydrocodone also get metabolized by 2D6, but you can see not to the same degree. Uh, how big is this 2D6 problem? It's probably millions of people that they've looked at, 30 Five to 50 million Europeans are either poor metabolizers or ultra-rapid metabolizers in respect to 2D6. So they've got problems on either end. Now, I know what you're probably saying. We're all Americans, and we don't have to worry about such things, but not so much. Um, so what do we have? Primarily, when you work with these things, you have four main phenotypes. You've got ultra-rapid, extensive, intermediate, and poor. The extensive in this case is normal. And a lot of people look at these reports and go, oh, extensive, that means they're chewing it up more. No, that's actually the normal metabolizer. Okay, when it's ultra rapid, then they might be chewing it up more. In the case of 2D6, it depends on whether you've got a pro drug or an active drug. In the case of 2D6, remember, codeine needed to be activated. So something, somebody who's an ultra reactive uh, metabolizer basically gets more accumulation. So actually, you get a higher level of morphine in ultra rapid metabolism. In a poor metabolizer, codeine simply doesn't work because they don't activate it. Now, what we've designed is there's no way you can remember all this stuff. So if it's in the chart, what happens is if you have that 2D6 information and there it goes out in the chart, looks in the chart to see if we have a problem. If we have a problem, then you get this alert. So it's really kind of convenient. So you don't even have to maybe go digging through the chart to be looking for star alleles or phenotypes or stuff like that. In this case, you're an ultra rapid. Now, you might say to yourself, well, gee, this is a little bit difficult for me to remember all this stuff. Well, we have an Ask Mayo Expert link right here. So if you click on this Ask Mayo Expert link, then you get Ask Mayo Expert come right up, and that can help you right out. So we've also worked in teams uh, together to put all this Ask Mayo Expert information uh, for you to use. And as you can see, there's different things you can click on. You can click on uh, different alternatives and things like that on the top. We also have expert tab up there in case you want to call somebody and ask for a phone a friend and ask for a little help. Um, they also give you the information depending on your phenotype. So if we know your, you know your phenotype, here's what we would do. And we also give you a little other helpful information, like if you say, OK, a codeine, should I test for such that? My patient is wondering, should I test for that? It's sort of like, now routine testing isn't recommended. And I'm pretty sure you guys could figure that out. Because if somebody comes in with a backache and they go, hey, genomic test, how about it? You go, yeah, well, you might not want to wait for five days for pain therapy or something like that. So that's not going to work out for you in this particular one. But if the information's already on the chart, why not use it? Drugs that are metabolized by 2D6. Codeine's a problem, tramadol's a problem, both for the same reason. Neither one of them get activated or they can accumulate in ultra-rapid metabolizers. Hydrocodone and oxycodone, even though they do go through 2D6, I still recommend that you consider them because they don't get metabolized to the same degree. Because the problem is, if you're working in the clinic, you don't have a lot of alternatives. The alternatives, if you're in the hospital, things like fentanyl, morphine, hydromorphone, fine. But I doubt, like, for a simple backlate, you want to go to dilaudid. Now, we talked a little bit about prodrugs. Now, active drugs are the reciprocals. Now, I've been talking about basically four different phenotypes, but you'll, you'll notice up there that, well, there's other ones up here. So I've got things like poor to intermediate, intermediate to extensive, intermediate to ultra rapid, and so on. And you're saying, well, what do I do with those? Those are kind of people have alleles in between those two things. What I often suggest is you probably defer to the worst case scenario. So I often look at people who are extensive to ultra rapid, I just kind of call them ultra rapid. People who are poor to intermediate, I might call them poor. And 
uh, work with them that way. Um, this uh, gives us a little more precision, but it doesn't necessarily give you uh, all the time a little more information on how to work with that. So again, I kind of defer back to the four sometimes when I'm just trying to think about some of these things. You can see again, in the case of an active drug, we have the reciprocal. What winds up happening in a poor metabolizer, the drug accumulates. In the uh, instance of a ultra-rapid metabolizer, we chew it up a little bit too much so it doesn't work for us as well. Now, primarily, I've been talking about things that are more pharmacokinetic and enzymatic. And many of the enzyme things work this way. If you're ever wondering about what drugs we have, you can simply go to Ask Mayo Expert and type pharmacogenomics in the search bar, and all our drugs will come up. So if you're wondering what kind of drugs we have, and I'll show you the list of them, you, you, there's many you can find information on. Now, if we look at the hypersensitivity kind of reaction, things like allopurinol, with the HLA uh, problem, we can see that one of the problems we can have with allopurinol is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. This is one of the reasons that primarily got me really motivated to work in pharmacogenomics, because as a clinical pharmacologist, and I spent most of my career prior to coming here uh, up on an uh, ICU working with patients, and that's where people with Stevens-Johnson usually wind up. Uh, if I never see another case in my life, I'll be happy. Um, but allopurinol can cause Stevens-Johnson. It's one of the kind of four nasty ones I often remind people where I look at sulfonamides, anticonvulsants, allopurinol, and NSAIDs are probably the most likely drugs to cause Stevens-Johnson. If you don't have a result, since this is so serious, we want you to test for an Asian population because it's, there's a very strong association of Stevens-Johnson in Asian population with, with this particular variant. What we want you to do is please test. You'll get an alert that says that. And if you get your test that comes back and it says this, it's basically going to say don't use this drug. So you'll want to use something else. Now you might say to yourself, okay, now I'm stuck. I want to use allopurinol. Well, once again, you can go to Ask Mayo Expert, and sometimes that can be very helpful to you to, uh, to recommend other alternatives you can use. So sometimes that's helpful. Now you might say, why did you say sometimes instead of it's not all the time helpful? That's because some situations, in the case of maybe anticoagulants and stuff like that, are so complicated, we can't just give you a little blurb on how you probably need to do that. So you might need a little more help on that, and you could talk to pharmacists, or you can consult with some of our experts on some of these things. Here's a list of all the drugs we're doing right now on um, different kinds of polymorphisms. Primarily, I, I break these up into just a couple different things. I look at things at first, um, hypersensitivity reactions, metabolic problems, or you know, transporter problems, pharmacokinetic problems, and drug reactions. And to give you, this is, you might look at this and say this is kind of complicated, but actually it is more complicated when you throw a bunch of drugs in. Okay, So to give you an idea of some of that, I'm going to have my colleague Eric come up and talk about a couple cases to illustrate how complicated things might get. Thank you. Before I get into the cases, I also want to share a little bit about what drives me. So in 2009, I started working with the Medication Therapy Management Group, a group of pharmacists who consult one-on-one -on -one, um, with patients who are on multiple medications, complex regimen. And what I found out was that most of these patients who were being referred by um, providers here at Mayo were taking medications that were one, either not effective, or two, were experiencing major adverse drug reactions to the point where you may see patients coming in with brief cases of medications, but we're not taking them. We were rather taking a lot of supplements that were not working for them. So fast forward last um, um, August, with the help of the um, IM clinic, we initiated the pharmacogenomics profile service. Now, most of you here might not know what that service is all about, but that service actually helps whereby providers can refer patients who may be having problems with their medications to consult with a pharmacist. Now, allow me to spend a little bit of time to describe what that service is all about. There are two pathways where patients can be referred to see a pharmacist. One is if the patient already has a provider here at Mayo, 
that provider can order the service, and the patient can be seen by a pharmacist. The other pathway is if a patient has heard about pharmacogenomics and wants to come to Mayo, but they do not have a provider here, what they'll then do is they'll come through a preventive service clinic who will then order the consult and the patient to be seen by a pharmacist. Now, what happens when the patient comes in to see the pharmacist? The pharmacist will review their current medications, explain what pharmacogenomics is all about and how pharmacogenomics could explain some of their medication intolerance. And then if the patient agrees, we'll then order the pharmacogenomic test for the patient. Some patients may want to be going back home. For those patients, we offer um, a phone consult for them to have the test results reviewed. Those who are local can come back for an after visit and have their results reviewed. Now, the cases that I'm about to present were all uh, patients who were referred by providers here at our clinic. Now, Sarah is a 75-year-old female, retired, she's home, she loves exercise, and unfortunately, each time she goes out to exercise, um, she experiences an increase in heart rates that is quite disturbing to her. So she comes to Mayo, she sees quite a number of providers here at Mayo, including Endo, and then she sees um, Dr. Stephen Texer in uh, nephrology. The patient says, well, Dr. Texer, I have tried multiple medications in the past, and when I took these medications, as I've listed up here, I did not tolerate them. So I'm a little bit worried about starting amitriptyline that you're recommending for me. Okay. Dr. Texas says, well, I've heard about pharmacogenomics, and with your multiple medication intolerance, I think it might be a good idea for you to go see our pharmacist. So the consult was ordered. Again, like I said initially, medications were reviewed um, prior to ordering the Nigene panel. And as you can see here, these are the side effects that the patient was experiencing from her medications. This is the result of the Nigene panel that we currently offer in, um, here at Mayo. This test is going to expand Dr. Lazaridis, will share more light on that. When Dr. Nicholson was presenting, he shared light about phenotypes. Now, if you look at this patient uh, from a genomic test result, you can see that CYP2C19 came up as poor. CYP2D6 came up as intermediate to extensive. And based on what Dr. Nicholson mentioned, we want to focus, especially for the intermediate to extensive, we're going to focus on the intermediate. Because for this patient, the intermediate is more worrisome, if I can use that word. Now, let's look at the medications that the patient had tried in the past. If you look at metoprolol, patient is um, CYP2D6 intermediate to um, extensive. There are current recommendations that say that and where are these recommendations coming from? I'll share light on that on the next slide. That patients who could be poor metabolizers of CYP2D6, we might want to reduce the initial dose that we give for metoprolol. If patients do not tolerate these medications, there are other recommendations that can be made. We might want to switch them to atenolol or cavidolol. In some cases, we can switch them to bisoprolol. So this could have explained why the patient did not tolerate some of the medications that she took in the past. Now, remember, amitriptyline has not been initiated yet. However, based on the patient past medication intolerance, she was hesitant in, to initiate this medication. Okay? Now, if you look up there, amitriptyline is a substrate of CYP2D6 and CYP2C19, meaning that if we had initiated this medication, there could have been a potential that the patient would have gone home and then sent us 15 or 20 phone calls saying that, I initiated the medication, the medication did not work for me, and then we have to then go back, increasing the time that we have to spend in fixing this problem. With the help of pharmacogenomic test results for this patient and the uh, clinical pharmacogenetics implementation consortium recommendation, we're able to say that we are not going to give you this medication. Okay? Now, this group, CPEC, also recommend that if you're going to use a tricyclic antidepressant, based on the patient's phenotype. In this case, CYP2D6 was intermediate, 
CYP2C19 was a poor metabolizer. If you're going to use it, you want to do some drug monitoring. So we knew, um, based on the patient, uh, what we called exercise-induced hypertension, that if we gave nortriptyline, we had to monitor. And the patient was aware of that going home. The patient called back two weeks later and said, I did not tolerate the medication. We knew that. There could be a potential that the patient was not going to tolerate it based on their genes. We discontinued the medication by tapering off, and then we started hydrochlorothiazide. We haven't heard back from the patient, so we're hoping all is well. Next case is Julie. Now, again, like I stated, all these patients were referred by providers here at Mayo. They did not come to Mayo initially for pharmacogenomic testing, but based on the knowledge that these providers had, they referred these patients to us. Now, Julie came in to see um, Dr. Wakes in our gynecology service. The patient um, had 18-year-old female with a history of depression, suicidal attempts. She had also a history of cutting herself. Now, she said, Eric, currently I don't take any medications because they haven't worked for me. I drink about seven shots of alcohol four times a week. Now, most of us know that if patients are telling us seven shots, they could be doing more. Um, she was smoking marijuana. And she said, Eric, I'm actually not taking any medications. Now, the reason why the patient came in was that 18 year old, she was going to be going to college. Mother was a little bit worried um, about pregnancy, so they wanted to initiate. Uh, birth control pills. The patient said, no, I don't want to take any more medications based on my experience with citalopramps, cetraline, fluoxetine, and the list goes on here. She did not want to try any new medications. Now, Dr. Wiggs knows about pharmacogenomics. So she said, well, hopefully, pharmacogenomics could help explain why you did not tolerate these medications. Julie said, Eric, when I took these medications in the past, they actually worsened my depression. my depression. I felt like my eyes were always dilated and I had severe tremors. Well, I would not want to take those medications either. So what did we do? After um, reviewing her medication history, we ordered an hygiene panel for her. And this is the result that we received for, for Julie. Again, if you remember from Dr. Nicholson's talk, he mentioned right, that most of the patients who, or individuals who were coming from Europe had an issue with CYP2D6. And we're seeing that in just the three cases that I'll be presenting, that most of the patients, random patients, have problems with CYP2D6. So as we prescribe medications that are either activated or, or cleared by CYP2D6, if patients are not tolerating those medications, we have to be aware or think of pharmacogenomics. Now, there's one other thing that I want to point out here. If you look at the second gene result, the SLCO1B1, it came up as increased risk. What does that mean? Well, this can help predict if patients are prescribed, say, simvastatin, medication that is commonly prescribed for the management of um, high cholesterol, this patient has an increased risk of Muscle pain. Knowing this, now the patient is not on simvastatin, but knowing this, I would not want to recommend simvastatin for this patient in the future. Right? So the test results, we're looking at how best the test results can help us now as well as in the future. Now, somebody will say, Eric, will you consider testing this patient's mother, siblings? We might want to do that, especially if they are thinking of initiating simvastatin or any other medications that are substrates of CYP2D6 in the future. Okay, so what did we recommend for this patient? Well, if you, if you go back, I think I've already shed a little bit of light on the fact that the past medications were either activated or cleared by these enzymatic pathways and could have contributed to the adverse reactions that the patient experienced. We then recommended an active metabolite for venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, 50 milligrams. Patient took it for about six months. When we contacted them six months later, she said, I've stopped cutting myself. I feel better. OK, 
Okay. However, there are days where I feel like I need an extra push. So we recommended buspirin to be added. I haven't heard back from the patient again. Okay. Now, the third case is quite complicated. The first two cases were dealing with drug gene relationships. Okay. In this case, at the end of it, I'll share more light as to some of the complications that drug, drug gene interactions can play. Disease states can also play major um, effect on how we move forward once we have pharmacogenomic test results. So Ted is a 16-year-old male. History of POTS, and POTS basically stands for um, posterior orthostatic uh, tachycardia. This patient came in to see Stephen, um, Stephanie Kynes in the uh, Pete's clinic. Now, Stephanie has been referring patients um, to the MTM clinic and said, Eric, can pharmacogenomics help this patient who has tried multiple medications? Patient has PADS. There are days where he has high blood pressure. There are days when he has orthostatic hypotension. Um, how, do I, how do I even manage this patient to start with? Now, above are the current medications that the patient was taking. The patient had tried metoprolol in the past and stated that, well, when I took metoprolol, I did not even feel like going out to play outside during school. I just wanted to stay inside because I was always tired. Well, a couple of things here. The mother said, could you tell me which genes would be relevant based on the patient's current medications, my son's current? And the reason was cost was an issue. And as Dr. Lazaretis will share, cost may not be an issue in the future. So mother said, I only want four genes tested. So again, we tested these four genes. And three of the four genes that we tested, if you remember what Dr. Nicholson stated, they were not normal, meaning that they were not extensive. Extensive stands for normal. There's one thing I want you to take away from this talk today is extensive, extensive is normal. So anything else outside of that is not normal, and you should be aware of that. There are so many times where I'll get a question from a patient who said, see, my, my test result says extensive. I have problems everywhere. You know, one thing that you want to take away is that that is actually normal. So again, if you look at the three genes, three out of the four genes, they were not normal and could have explained some of the medication intolerance that the patient experienced. Um, I, will not, I will not go in depth into each one of these, but the point that I want to share here is that if you look at metodrine, which is a prodrug, in light of the patient's intermediate status of CYP2D6, could not have been effective for this patient. If you look at propranolol, again, as I mentioned with metoprolol, propranolol could not have been effective for this patient or could have caused more side effects. If you look at respiridone, respiridone goes through cyp 2 c D6 and 3A4, based on the result, it could have been an issue. So again, we have multiple medications going through various enzymatic pathways and could have contributed to some of the adverse drug reaction that the patient was experiencing. So for third case, which I stated quite complicated, we have multiple polymorphisms going on, right? If you look at this patient, CYP2C19, right, he was a poor metabolizer. In the future, if this patient is to take, say, um, clopidogrel, right, that medication may not work for this patient, increasing the risk of blood clots. If the patient is to try a medication like citalopram, that medication may not work. Right? So we have multiple polymorphism going on for this patient. Resperidone and metodrin, um, although for this patient was not experiencing dystonia, there's an incre increased risk of dystonia with the combination of these medications. So there are times where patients may be taking multiple medications. The first thing you want to do as a pharmacist is review the drug-drug interactions <coughs> and see um, how the drug-drug interactions can then come on top of the drug-gene interactions, which I'll try and explain with the next point here. The patient was taking methylphenidate. Methylphenidate is a weak inhibitor, okay? of CYP2D6, meaning that although the patient um, CYP2D6 is an intermediate status, taking an inhibitor could then move this from the patient status from intermediate to poor metabolizer, meaning all the medications that I initially talked about could not work in light of the patient's poor metabolizer status, right? Um, just to share a little bit of light on inducers. We have medications such as um, 
carbamazepine, which is a very um, powerful inducer. Rifampine is a very powerful inducer. If patients are in a status of, let's say, extensive metabolizer status, and you give them any of these inducers, it could switch them from the extensive metabolizer status to ultra-rapid. So things to be mindful of. Now, take-home message for TED. We recommended that we taper off the Risperidone. Why? Because the patient was taking Risperidone for sleep. And the patient was already telling us that they were always groggy and tired at school, which could, which could be explained where the metho methylphenidate blocking the clearance of Risperidone causing an increased concentration of that medication. It wasn't, it wasn't needed for this patient, so we slowly taper off that medication. In light of the patient's um, CYP2D6 status, we also recommended not to initiate a metoprolol again in the future. This is, this is what we did for this patient. Now, there's one other point that I want to I state here. The, the pharmacogenomic tax force, as well as you know, working with the IM clinic and Center for Individualized Medicine, has come up with CDC rules, right? These are clinic, clinical decision support rules that these patients, these three patients that I talked about here, as well as all the patients who've had pharmacogenomic testing done, since August I've had about 45 to 50 patients who've come through the clinic. These patients, once they have medications ordered, by any provider here at Mayo, based on the CDS rules that are embedded in our medical record, they will get an alert, right? So pharmacogenomics, at the end of the day, can help us um, improve medication experience for our patients. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lazaretis to tell us about the services that we currently have, as well as the future. So you may ask, what the gastroenterologist is going to tell you about genomics? Uh, well, uh, blame my mentors from Mayo who sent me to the NIH to be um, mentored by Dr. Collins. After I went there, I've been brainwashed. So for me, genomics is uh, an important item of my uh, scientific and uh, practicing life here at Mayo. Um, so um, several years before the announcement of the Precision Medicine Initiative by the President in uh, 2015, Mayo Clinic Leadership established the Center for Individualized Medicine uh, to bring genomics to uh, patient care and to transform the practice. And within the center, uh, early on, about now three and a half years ago, we thought important to establish an individualized medicine clinic. Uh, from now on, I'm going to use the term IM clinic, just to bring genomics uh, close to clinical practice. And uh, we have many uh, different services within this uh, clinic. We may have seen our recent paper in the proceedings about diagnostic odysseys. Uh, we now are moving to predictive genomic services. We're introducing uh, pharmacogenomics to the, uh, to, to the practice. And we, li we like to move on also to specialty clinics where we bring this to neurocardiology and GI. But why offering pharmacogenomics testing? Uh, I think I can convince you that knowing uh, our, on an annual basis, we spend about $136 billion in the US uh, on adverse drug reactions. And equally importantly, for every dollar we use uh, for a prescription of a, uh, on a patient, we spend another 50 cents for this prescription to treat adverse drug reactions. Importantly also to know that pharmacogenomics is probably important for everybody. Everyone in this room probably uh, uh, could be affected. This is uh, an outcome of the Mayo Clinic Right Protocol, where about 1,000 uh, participants of the Mayo Biobank were uh, genotyped on 16 pharmacogenes, 15 pharmacogenes, of which I saw here the results of five actionable gene variants. And as you can see, 99% of these individuals, they had at least one gene variant for which uh, uh, it, was, it will be important uh, to know and it will have uh, uh, implications in, in the clinical practice. So with this in mind and the impact that those uh, findings can bring to the clinical practice, we thought within the IM clinic will be important for us to establish pharmacogenomics uh, pilots initially. And we did stuff those with my pharmacology pharmacy partner, uh, Eric Mati, seeing those patients at noontime. 
uh, gathering experiences, learn how to uh, understand those reports, at least for me, and uh, through Eric's support and, and mentorship on pharmacogenomics. And then we gather this information, we learn um, uh, our lessons and we got our experiences, we brought those uh, opportunities of pharmacogenomics offerings to the executive health program, to the preventing services clinic, and more recently to the international clinic. This has been a tremendous experience for us in the IM clinic to learn from these processes. And what we realized is that there are a number of elements you have to have to make this happen. First of all, you need a medical champion who is dedicated to the process to bring this process together. You need also a dedicated pharmacist like Eric who spends the time to see all the cases and learn from these procedures. We were also uh, very uh, fortunate to have support from DLMP to have uh, available to us the first ever pharmacogenomics clinical testing uh, for the IM clinic. Uh, it's an expensive test, and I will go back to this, but it was very useful to, to, uh, to take this opportunity to be able to assess our patients who will come to this practice. Equally importantly was the ability to work with OneOM, a joint Mayo venture, which provides an outstanding integrated report uh, to be able to interpret these uh, results but otherwise it's very challenging uh, uh, to make sense of them uh, if you go and see randomly uh, those in a medical record. And equally importantly too, we had the ability of the pharmacogenomics task force that Dr. Nicholson is headed, where we were making progress not only to embed those results into the electronic medical record but also to create clinical decision alerts and, and tools so we can um, uh, find out how this works in real practice and what we can do to prevent those events in practice. This slide shows you the nine uh, gene panel um, uh, that is offered by DLMP, uh, for which we tested most of these individuals in the past. There are six genes focusing on the SIP system, and then three about uh, warfarin resistance, semvastatin, myopathy, and allopurinol. Uh, and you may wonder how this dynamic report that comes from UNOM looks when it comes back, uh, I will share with you my own results. Uh, so here in green, you see in different categories what I can take as directed. Here in yellow, those are medications that I have to adjust uh, the medication for me because I may be a poor metabolizer or an ultra rapid metabolizer. But importantly, what I found from this exercise doing to myself, I was uh, positive for HLA-B5801. Now, in this audience, probably uh, uh, if someone takes our pure null, uh, uh, the chance of developing Stevens Johnson is about 4 to 5 percent. In my case, this is about 50 percent. So uh, this is now part of my medical record. So if someone is going to uh, attempt to uh, give me uh, allopurinol, you're going to find this uh, alert. Uh, and it may save me from a significant side effect. Now, it's about 15 percent of the Asians. It's about 1 percent of Caucasians, as I understand. But uh, still, uh, again, it's very important uh, for us to know. And this, to me, proves uh, on a personal level the importance of pharmacogenomics. Equally importantly, I can tell you that uh, when you do genetics, and among those pharmacogenetics, uh, it's the ripple effect. It's not about only you, it's about your family members. Once you know you may have a severe uh, um, adverse drug reaction, you should test other family members because it can prevent uh, a lot of things and save lives. This is where we are today. Uh, and this is where we're going to go in the near future. Uh, we like to make uh, prescriptions personal. We now uh, work with OneOM where they try to offer a clinical test um, in their own lab at a very affordable price. Actually, the new test that we'll be able to offer later this year, it will be no few thousand, but few hundred dollars. This uh, it has been a significant bottleneck for testing in the past, as uh, Eric Matti mentioned, but at this point, that will be a game changer for us. We also continue to work with ONOM to create a dynamic and a very integrated report, which is critical for, for this practice. We think that for the um, average patient who has uh, needs of pharmacogenomics, many of us will be able to do it in years to come, provided the appropriate tools. If I have done it, many of you can do it. But yet, there are going to be significant cases, particularly like uh, TED, that Eric Mati presented, where uh, collaboration with pharmacy, interaction with pharmacy will be critically important to address those issues uh, for years to come. So we hope in, 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 uh, in some time from now to be able to show you how this dynamic tool works in a clinical practice where we take the patient's profile, the pharmacogenomics testing, 
what this means for a particular medications, how uh, you can choose alternatives and, and, and try to find the right medication for the right patient. As I mentioned, the, uh, the new testing that comes from, uh, from Monome uh, Lab, uh, it will cover 23 genes, uh, and uh, we're talking about 300 plus drugs. This is important because the current test is 150. We're going to expand uh, the way to, uh, to able to, in to interpret uh, what people take and what they should take. At the same time, we think it's very important for the IM clinic to start uh, moving um, and approaching uh, the pharmacogenomics testing on areas where we think there is higher yields. And that's what we call the practice improvement project that we like to engage into. As Eric mentioned, uh, many of the patients who take multiple medications, probably it's in a group which we have to apply pharmacogenomics to every single of them. And now that the practice is going down, I think this becomes affordable. As you can see here, People more than 65, they take a lot of prescriptions, and about 30% of their hospitalizations are due to adverse drug reactions or non-compliance. So we like to develop this project, which is now in the works, to evaluate and improve polypharmacy in, in elderly. We're going to use the UNOM uh, new uh, gene panel for this testing. At the same time, we find also uh, areas like the GM Utility Clinic, where, again, there is a lot of polypharmacy uh, in, that, uh, in that space. We found in a, in a preliminary uh, report we ran that among those patients in a year, 60% of them, they take at least one psychotropic, and about 30% they take two or more. Now, we have some anecdotal evidence by testing with it for some uh, cases that they come with symptoms of motility, but maybe as providers, we make them having the symptoms. And so we believe that if someone is uh, treated properly, having a pharmacogenomics panel in hand, uh, it will uh, improve uh, the care of these patients. And actually, we like to do the study where we have GI doctors and uh, psychiatrists work hand to hand, whether knowing uh, the pharmacogenomic result or be blinded, and see how this uh, outcome of patients uh, going to be three years later whether pharmacogenomic testing didn't make a change uh, for their care. I'd like to end uh, with a slide talking about the Mayo Clinic Right Protocol 10,000. This is another investment from the Center for Individualized Medicine where we now collaborate with Baylor College to genotype about 10,000 Mayo, Mayo Biobank participants for 76 uh, pharmacogenes of which 15 of those are going to be actionable and part of the electronic medical record. So those are going to be sequenced and preemptively placed in the electronic medical record. And therefore, if I am uh, in your position and you like to do a study for a common phenotype of interest, whether this is uh, hypertension or hyperlipidemia or low back pain, and you want to involve pharmacogenomics, you're going to have a very unique population, well phenotyped, with a lot of pharmacogenomic results for which you can go after and see whether uh, the pharmacogenomics testing has been helpful. I think this is something that will come for free to you uh, as far as uh, testing goes, and we like to see uh, uh, participants from the medical community to help us understand better uh, this um, group of patients who were testing around actively. Our take-home message is that pharmacogenomics is here to stay. It becomes affordable now, and it will be key uh, part of our practice. We have done significant progress into the space of uh, decision-making and support tools, which are now are available. And we need to keep educating ourselves and uh, all the practitioners so we can use this opportunity to improve patient care. Thank you for your attention, and I will close this uh, presentation with a video. Uh, thank you. Their research helped me. I'm still alive. You can see I'm doing better than I was when I was 50. So I'm you know, just happy. It works so well. I actually had to be on the lowest dose and then reduced to half a tablet. And um, my blood pressure has been phenomenal since. Had it not been for the testing at Mayo that they did for me, 23 other people's lives have been affected by this one thing that Mayo has done. And that's just one. I cannot imagine, if you really dug into it, how many would have been affected. What a gift. 
my dad was having a liver transplant. He was in the hospital, in ICU, not doing good. And a time in my life where I would be prone to having a panic attack every night because I was living in a hospital every single day of the week for like three months, and I didn't have one panic attack. If everybody was tested, my God, you'd know, okay, you're a four and a five, or you're a four, or you're whatever, these drugs will not work for you. Why waste the time and the effort and the money? The insurance company just made tons of money. And the people would feel better. They'd get some results. Thank you.